to, to start out with, I'm in the, uh, the veterinary research complex, which is uh, in the College of Veterinary Medicine, and my laboratory is on the fourth floor, and the other students in my lab. And, and for the lecture today, the, the presentation focus will be obviously on chemistry, on mental chemistry, and how we've used chemistry uh, to, to apply it uh, to uh, help remediate these compounds known as mycotoxins. And to do that, we're working on ways to solve them, especially with clay minerals. And um, that's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. These compounds called mycotoxins have a major impact. They're toxic metabolites, actually they're secondary metabolites, of fungi that can occur on food <coughs> that you eat, and then also in animal feed. And they've been strongly implicated in disease and death, and not only in animals, but also in humans. You've probably seen some of these molds. Um, this is an aspergillus mold growing on kernel corn, <coughs> very common, and produces some really bad toxins. Uh, this is a blue-greenish uh, penicillin mold. You've seen this on your cheeses. You've probably seen it on uh, bread that you uh, left in the refrigerator uh, past its shelf life. <clears throat> you may have even eaten some of that accidentally. Uh, hopefully you don't do that too often because these can be really uh, toxic, cytotoxic chemical. And then these um, pigmented, uh, pinkish to reddish uh, fusarium uh, fungi can produce some extremely toxic compounds. Uh, one of which has even been implicated in a chemical warfare agent in Laos and Cambodia. <clears throat> More than 300 of these, these fungal toxins that, that occur in corn and peanuts and cotton seed and pretty much uh, all foods, they're ubiquitous. Uh, out of these that have been identified chemically, <clears throat> I would say there's seven that are frequently reported to occur in, in your food and in your vegetables. I'd like to make a point here <coughs> that exposure is, is, is variable here um, and, and based on a lot of different things that we're going to go into. But the basic tenet in toxicology is it's the dose that makes the poison. And remember that, that's always the case. Uh, you can drink too much water um, over a short period of time and you can drink or salt. Everything is potentially toxic. And according to its chemistry, and, and uh, how it affects cells, <coughs> some are more indigenously toxic uh, and or carcinogenic or mutagenic than others. These seven are the ergots, the apotoxins, which we'll get to a little bit later, trichothecines, zeralimone, ochratoxins, capsulin, and humonocins. Now, you probably already um, are, are seeing these types of structures. Uh, these are energy minimized, semi empirical energy minimized, uh, quantum mechanical. Uh, structures that of these compounds I'm going to tell you about. And this one, ergotamine, is one of the oldest um, known man. And it's a three four substituted indole derivative of lysergic acid. Okay, so you've all heard of LSD. This is where it came from, from a natural product. And this has been linked to the Salem witchcraft trial. This has been linked to the, to the, uh, the Grand Cube, which was the great panic before the French Revolution and the French Revolution. And, and a lot of other things because of the fact that these compounds, because of their chemistry and their toxicology, cause central nervous system effects and hallucinations and gangrene. And, and again, if you look back at the epidemics in time, you can see where these are were definitely a problem and still may be. This is aflatoxin B1. I'm going to get more into this a little bit later in the lecture. T2 toxin is a sesquiterpenoid. This is the one I mentioned that's been used uh, as a chemical warfare agent. It was linked to an agent called Yellow Rain. If you may remember that, you probably don't. This was in the 80s. And, um, but it's extremely necro uh, necrotic, and it causes uh, system, uh, effects on the immune system and a lot of very uh, potent uh, toxicology to both animals as well as humans. Uh, this is a Ralinone. Uh, in the vet school, which is where I'm at, we see problems with, with uh, swine. Uh, reproductive problems in swine and other animals, and it can be due to this which they have in their brain. And I wanted to show you the chemistry. Uh, the, the main effect is, is reproductive problems, uh, hyperestrogenism, because it looks like estrogen. So chemically, you can see the semblance. I've got estradiol here. The two hydroxyl groups are about the same binding, and this binds to the estrogen receptor, just like estradiol does, and it competes with it, and it causes problems. 
And here's another chemical. Uh, I guess the point I'm making here is there's 300 of these. I'm only showing you seven, and they all have very diverse uh, chemistry. So I think that's important. This is a chlorinated dihydroisocumarin derivative linked to, this is nitrogen in blue, l beta phenylalanine, you know, an amino acid. If you cleave that off, it's fairly labile. If you cleave it off, it's not toxic anymore. So the chemistry is extremely important into the, the reactivity in cells, uh, and the DNA, etc. This is known as okra toxin A because it fluoresces green. You know, okra is, is a means of, of green color. And so it fluoresces green, and it causes a disease in the balkans uh, that are linked to the kidneys, balkan nephropathy, and in swine it causes uh, kidney disease. And it's also been shown, we've shown in my lab and other labs, that it can uh, cause prenatal dysmorphogenesis, which is birth defects. It can affect the growing embryo and the fetus. It causes all kinds of birth defects. This is found in red wine. Uh, I'm an editor of a journal out of London, who had the contaminants. Everybody's sending me their papers where they serve up their wine. So all the reds and the city reds have this compound in them in different micrograms of wine. Now, is that good or bad? Again, you have to do the risk assessment and determine. But remember, again, it's the dose that makes the poison. I don't want to be, be uh, drinking overtops. Paculin is a uh, small lactone, and um, the neat thing about this one, actually, remember these come from fungi. So this is a great antibacterial agent. It, it's even been shown in the 40s, and it was published in JK, which is a respectable journal in the 40s, to have antiviral problems. They, they looked at uh, people in the Navy and, and they had symptoms of the common cold, and, and they had a 98% cure rate when they gave them actual uh, uh, fluid. And so, um, everywhere I've been, all over the world, everybody says that they kind of own the uh, analogy of the, of the fact that uh, an apple a day will keep the doctor. And so that may be very possible based on the science and the chemistry of what we know is an apple juice and grape juice. And I've tested the market here in College Station. There's a whole variety of brands. Everyone I've tested has different levels, micrograms usually, of patchulin, which is, again, is a good antibiotic. The only thing is too much of it cause cytotoxicity and affect the homeostasis of cells. So again, we go back to the, to the dose. And then this, the last one is the new kid on the block. This is a 20 carbon uh, ecosane, and, and it's kind of like a sphingolipid. It's got a, a amino group here that goes up to the carbon two position, and tricarbolic acid more these on downfield. This one is caused a lot of problems in horses. They even quit putting corn in the Midwest in horse feed after they saw this in what they call moldy corn toxicosis. The horse is very sensitive to this compound and it can kill horses uh, and cause major, major effects, central nervous effects, and, and it, it, it causes holes in the brain. So it's a, it's a, it's a neurotoxic substance as well. And it's, it's found in corn. Almost all corn has this. Uh, now, Probably the, the most studied, if it's not the most significant, of these mycotoxins we're talking about are the apotoxins. And that's what I'm going to tell you about the rest of the lecture. This is apotoxin B1, three ways to represent it. You're used to this uh, two dimensional structure, and then this is the energy minimized structure, uh, and showing the same thing here in the sticks. Uh, apotoxin B1 is the most potent of four naturally occurring apotoxins. So, in corn and in peanuts, and, and like I said, it's ubiquitous in almost everything, you'll see this compound, and uh, it's, it's a really major toxin and carcinogen. It's one of the most potent carcinogens known to man, and, and it's, in, it's in our food, and it, it's, in, it's, in, it's in your milk, it's in your ice cream and metabolite. B1 is a potent foodborne cancer causing agent, but it's also a catatoxic, that means that it affects the liver, and it affects the immune system. And importantly, it causes problems with nutrition. It's anti-nutritional. The source is Aspergillus flavus and Crepsidicus fungi. They can occur in the field, especially during drought. And of course, that's what we have a lot of here in the and after drought, and in August, when the corn comes in, that's when we start to see these levels in our ice cream, and our milk, and our, and our corn. Uh, and drought is a common cause of fungal infection and enhanced production of the alcohol. Now, so why am I talking about the ground? Because the Earth is in a, is in a heating cycle. It, 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 it's definitely warming up around here. And, and what happens when it heats up, and, and especially in certain parts of the globe, is you get drought-stricken plants, the 
to produce uh, bad corn, for instance, that, that's extremely moldy and produces a lot of these compounds that I'm talking about. The equatorial zone, you can see defined as 20 degrees latitude north and south of the equator. That's changed over the last 10 to 20 years. The compass has twice that now. It's 40 degrees north and south of the equator. That's what's happened with the warming. And look where that cuts North America off. Texas is definitely in that, the, the, the southeast. Uh, and the southern Midwest is now cutting across that, that zone. Now, I'm calling this the hot zone. Uh, and, and, and what I have found from looking at who lives here, there's 4.5 billion people who are highly exposed. This hot zone is where you're going to see these fungi growing for the most part and producing these metabolites that are carcinogenic. So in this area of the globe, this, of course, encompasses a lot of what we call developing countries that don't have ways to, you know, survey and regulate this stuff in their foods like we, we do. And they're highly exposed to cause a real problem. So what, what are we talking about exposing to the diet? It's considerably enhanced in developing countries, as I mentioned. Humans and animals are uh, in these countries uh, is, is largely uncontrolled. And the hot zone would be Africa, Africa, <laughs> India, China, Latin America, Africa. It impacts the poorest people, and that's what I have found. It, it, it's, these are the ones who are most likely to consume foods contaminated with aflatoxins and suffer the consequences. Today I'm going to show you my site in Africa, and uh, these people have moldy food, and, and they don't have enough food. And so they're going to eat moldy food before they starve. And so we're trying to come up with a way to help counteract that. Uh, so that they can go ahead and eat this moldy food but not absorb the toxins. So that's really where I'm going with this presentation. The consequences of exposure. Another problem is in young, the all species are more susceptible. When animals present to us at the best school, we, we, we usually almost always see the young showing more symptoms than, than adults. And the same goes for humans. And that makes for even a worse problem than what we, what we can imagine. Uh, increased risk of liver cancer from infection with hepatitis. Many of the people in the area we work with have a really have a high rate in the population of infection with hepatitis, and that tends to increase the, the risk of liver cancer. This is a metastatic carcinoma in uh, We see a lot of this due to aflatoxin. That's, that's again, is the main target. And you can't, it looks like you can't see this very well. But this is a, this is a uh, here, you can get over here. It's a piece of DNA I've modeled. It's a hexamer with six bases. And, and basically, this is aflatoxin percolating. It binds at carbon-8, uh, which forms an epoxide in, in the cell. And it binds to, um, instead of wanting to a nucleophilic condition, and it intercalates across the, the chain of DNA. And that's how it codes for this cancer. Uh, also, we see a suppression of the immune system. This is well established in animals. Recently, we've, we've uh, published this from our site in humans. Dr. Jolly is a colleague of mine. She works with HIV AIDS, and she's an immunologist at the uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham. We also see significant decreases in serum and liver vitamin A levels. Remember I told you <coughs> it's anti-nutritional? It decreases vitamin A, and it, it affects vitamin D and selenium and zinc and other micronutrients. And that's not good where we're at, because the children where we're at still have, they don't get enough vitamin A. And I don't know if you remember what happens, I'm sure. We don't see that here. But without vitamin A, which was the first vitamin discovered, you, you can go blind. It's called night blindness. And so we see a lot, a lot of night blindness in the children and in the population that we're working with. Uh, and then it, it causes malnutrition and growth retardation because it interferes with these nutrients. So we see differences when we look at the level of exposure in the blood and aflatoxin is related directly to z scores. You know, so height to, to, to uh, age and weight scores uh, are, are definitely associated linearly with aflatoxin ingestion. And then it can cause death in humans. The recent outbreak in eastern and central provinces of Kenya had a 39% mortality rate. In other words, people died from eating corn that was so, so highly contaminated. Now, I want you to remember something. The high level they were ingesting was 8,000 parts per day. This is important for something I'm going to tell you later in the morning. So how do we solve the problem? There's a variety of interventions that can reduce biologically effective dose in the cell. Is that a bird or a bird? He needs to be a child kid. He's trying to find his way back. So anyway, the intervention that reduce the 
biological effective dose of cell can be what we call chemo protective agents. And these are agents that uh, they're found in, in, in foods uh, and in teas and things, and they can modulate the metabolism of, of uh, these compounds. And, and they work by uh, stimulating genes that produce uh, goes on and transferase that, that binds to these compounds and, and helps them become metabolized and excreted. And these are some of the guys working with these. Ultrapran is, is, a, is a compound from broccoli, and, and these are organic sulfur compounds, also precipitous vegetables. And these are good for you because these help your cells metabolize these things. These are called secondary interventions. Chlorophyll is also good. Green tea polyphenols are good. Those are catechins and ethicatechins and other phytochemicals. That's another lecture. What I'm working on, and I want to show you here, are interventions that reduce the external dose. I'm the only one doing this. So this is the primary intervention, meaning that I'm giving something that binds or sequesters or enterosorbs these toxins in the stomach and intestine and prevents them from getting into the blood and decreases their bioavailability and the exposure. By primary method. Now, ideally, what would be good would be to have both secondary and primary, and that's what we're hoping to do is combine these types of interventions. And notice the play, this is what I want to tell you about. It acts as a selective neurosorber, meaning it binds aflatoxins in, in the stomach and intestines. It diminishes their bioavailability in the blood and targeted tissue. And the advantage for working with this in, in Africa is it's culturally acceptable. They eat plays. There's just a myriad of different clays in the markets that are sold. So they're already used to eating clays over there for various reasons. <coughs> and it's uh, geophagy, in other words, is what that's called, it's common. And it's sustainable for highly exposed populations and it's environmentally benign. <coughs> so that's why I, I set about to try to define what's going on with these types of clays and animals. Now, geophagy is the ingestion of earth. Animals and humans have done this for centuries over all time. Uh, <coughs> I would ask how many of you have eaten, uh, okay, <laughs> there's a great hand. Uh, but we know that ruminants, for instance, this bad is looking at me over here. <laughs> uh, And they form these, these interlayers because they sandwich 
and like a deck of cards, these names in place. So you have these, these interlayers. It, it varies by groups and species and, and a variety of other things. But when I model the top, you can see the doctrinal hole. And then here's the plate that's in a, in a spatial uh, model. And so this is what we're dealing with. This is a, a piece of Nova Silk plate <coughs> that we've modeled and it's very close to what we're dealing with, minus the cat hands on the interlayer of the gallery. And before we start doing the study, we want to be sure that this stuff is clean. Hey, when you're dealing with, with dirt and soil, you've got some, some bad things in there. You have some priority metals that are carcinogenic. You even have them in your foods, by the way. Remember, I said the dose makes the poison. It's important. These arsenic, arsenic's in, in uh, seafood, it, it, it's in a lot of plants, uh, cadmium, chromium, all of these, these priority metals, we looked at. And we, we looked at it at a three gram dose, because our target is to be able to give three grams of this to, to animals and also humans. And in three grams, when we, when we uh, looked at this, it was below the depth of WHO, or what they call the tolerable data human intake level, considerably lower than that, what was in the which made us feel good. So that meant that you know, taking this clay is going to be less toxin exposure than most of the foods that, that are being eaten. And that included all the kind of octocoral dibenzid oxygen. You heard of the PCDs and, and the oxygen, how bad they are. This thing is, uh, it was equal to 0 0.002 parts per quadrillion and three grams of it. So very low and within the regulations and even for the oxygen. But remember that, if you don't take anything from plants or whatever, remember it does have other things that could be bad. In studies, uh, a lot of studies we've done in the lab, we've done structure activity, we've developed analogs of the molecules, the binding specificity, the capacities, and we've run what's called isotherms to, to determine those capacities and identities. And even the enthalpy, the thermodynamics is extremely important. Enthalpy is delta H, and it's, it's a heat measure, it's, it's the heat absorption. And, and it tells you whether you have chemisorption or whether you have this van der Waals fraction or hydrogen bond. And that's important because it's going to work in the gastrointestinal. Um, just very quickly in my lab, we grind and give these, these plates we're looking at, and we react them and incubate them for 24 hours. And the graphopoxy uh, fluoresces quite nicely, and it also is detected by UV infection. This is an isotherm that shows nice binding and uh, saturable binding of graphopoxy D1, and uh, basically we've developed mathematical models. I'm not going to go in that, uh, into that with you, but that uh, can tell us, uh, based on the, the fit, uh, of whether or not this, uh, this is a fit to linear or, or it's a homogeneous size, a heterogeneous size, and, and we can get the two maxes, the maximum binding, and infinity, and the enthalpy derived from it. Uh, here's just the mechanism that we use chemistry, which again, this lecture is about chemistry, what you can do with chemistry. Uh, just some general fundamental chemistry uh, with, with these isotherms to, to help us determine uh, where, where this thing is binding. And we have we found the total surface area of this clay is about 850 meters squared per gram. The external surface is about 70. I have special machines for similar in my lab that will measure these kinds of things. And we have um, X-ray fraction analysis. But when we heat collapse this, when you look at the, the DTA of this compound, you have around 700. And heat hydroxide, and it collapses. That inner layer shows you just comes apart and smacks, smacks it down. So when I collapse it with heat, uh, here's the, what the isotherms look like. So that suggests that it needs the inner layer, this gallery, to bind these toxins. Uh, and we also found that there's stereo and regio specificity. This is not an antibody. You expect to see that in an antibody, but this is a inorganic material. But when we look at impact aflatoxin, and then we look at humans and we, we synthesize some things that have some, some uh, carbonyl, one carbonyl, one hydroxyl, uh, or two carbonyl, or just a human, <coughs> or psychopentanol ring. Uh, we saw, saw a big difference in the, in the type of binding, the, the strength of binding with the various ligands that we tested. And our conclusion was, even here, what was interesting, this is aflatoxicol 1. This carbonyl, this is oxygen, carbon double bond oxygen, and hydroxyl. Hydroxyl is coming out of the back plane of the room that you can see that. Here, the stereoisomer is going back behind the plane, so it's 50% less uh, active uh, with uh, no cell play than, than this uh, one is. And so there's definitely stereo and regio specificity comparing aflatoxins. 
and we also saw electronic and steric effects. We ran, we ran a chemical structure index, we looked at all the different analogs, and we measured, uh, what I did is uh, we put the, the partial charges together for two carbons, the carbons that had the, the carbonyl, C1 and C11, and that chart we, we plotted versus the pythons binding. And you notice, our square wasn't too good, it's like a 0.89. Now, if I remove these outliers, now you're not supposed to do that, but if I remove the outliers, the R squared goes up to 0.97. That's, you know, obvious. But I was going to see what the outliers were. And what the outliers were, they were compounds that had the plane on the, on the opposite side of apicots. And I didn't tell you about this, it's plane. Uh, and, and the other side, the, the, the one terminal pure end is kinked in the cis configuration uh, out from the plane. So the planar side, if you disrupted the planar side with hydroxyl group, you, uh, this is what was causing uh, less binding. So the conclusion was the optimal orientation is planar at those seal surfaces, so it probably needs that planarity to go into dock and, and to give you a binding. And then, we're just about through the planar stuff here. Uh, we looked at enthalpy, and you can do enthalpy, uh, there's a lot of ways you can do it microcalorimically, but you can also derive it and it works very nicely to use your, your uh, linear equations at different temperatures. And we, we pull the KD out of, out of the linear equation here, and we use the Van Clough equation then at the different temperatures to calculate uh, enthalpy or delta H. And what we found was uh, for Nova Seal, delta H is like minus 50 kilojoules per mole. What that means is that it's sharing electrons a really tight bond. It's not a Van der Waals attraction or just a hydrogen bond. It's tight. And that's why probably why it really works and goes through the whole gas and tetra track without associating. And, and we think the price of possibility of electron, what we call electron donor, except the reaction at the surface of the plane. Now, we've done a lot of, after we chemically told us what's going on here, we said, does this work in animals? Let's test it. And we tested the young animals. So the young are more susceptible to this. We tested the young chicks, the young turkey folks, the pigs, pregnant female rats, the, 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 the fetuses uh, after birth, and, and we, we tested the dairy animals because the metabolite gets in milk, and in the milk products, cheese and ice cream can also have very toxic compounds in them that you're ingesting. So we were looking at all of that, and, and our conclusions in these animal studies um, were that there were no adverse health effects from consuming this clay, and it diminished exposure and toxicity with, when clay was in the dye. In all cases, it decreased M1 in the milk in, in these uh, dairy animals as well. And uh, it was, this was what was important. There was evidence for specificity in vivo. My lab and other labs have tried to see the work against the Ralinone. Remember I mentioned the one that looked like estrogen? Uh, Ergox, Don, P2, Ultra 5, <coughs> It doesn't work. It only works against apicot. So it again says it's very selective, which is a good thing. Now, a lot of people say, oh, that's bad. It should work against all 300. Well, if it worked against all 300 mycotoxins, the problem would be that it would bind the kitchen sink. That would mean it would bind vitamins, and it would, it would uh, influence nutrition, and, and uh, anything else. So it was a really good finding that we, we found that it was selective. So we were very glad to see it. Importantly, it protected aflatoxin in these early coping studies as high as 7,500 parts per billion in the diet. Remember that 8,000 I showed you? That's what was killing humans. So at 0.5%, if you're looking at a U.S. ton, 2,000 pounds, that's only like 10 pounds in 2,000. That's just enough to give a uniform distribution. It's just a very small amount. So it's a very high penalty, and it could have prevented the deaths in those, those people in Kenya. So that's how I get excited. You know, when I see this kind of thing, I'm thinking, I've got to move this technology on. Now, it, 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 it affects dogs in Texas and also in Carolina in 2006. You may have seen it on the TV. I was trying to take a vacation somewhere, and they called me about this. And uh, this is, there's still lawsuits going on about this because a lot of dogs died. They became lethargic, <coughs> loss of appetite, appetite affects the liver. Uh, they got low-grade infectious diseases because it also affects the immune system. The treatment was to remove the source of aflatoxin that the dogs were still dying. In the historical perspective, by the way, in India in 1974, dogs died first because they were feeding from the table, and then they realized, wow, we have a problem. Dr. Bach, one of my colleagues from India, uh, 
he realized it was too late. 100 out of 400 children then died from that incidence of contaminated remains. And we have all kinds of those types of stories from around the world. Uh, we've done a study with our colleague, Dr. Bauer, and one of his students uh, on this committee out in Bingham. And we use we used six male dogs. We did not hurt these dogs at all, by the way. Uh, we used subclinical doses of aflatoxin, and they were housed in metabolic cages. And during the 48 hour urine collection period, we either gave them uh, Novacil that was uh, coated in the diet and extruded even, you know, and pelletized the uh, at the same percentage. And lo and behold, what we found was it reduced aflatoxin M1, which is a bowel marker for exposure by almost 50 <coughs> in the clay coated and the clay included, which means that type of reduction in aflatoxin would have saved all these dogs. If that had been in the dog food, this is a pelleting aid, it would have saved all those dogs. We would have had any problems. So all of the, 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 the companies now are starting to look at this and do uh, some long-term research on it. And, and they should be including this in dog food in the near future, hopefully. Um, so then it can be used there's a lot of papers out there if you're interested. Just put my name up and Google it, and uh, you'll, you'll be able to uh, find uh, a lot of papers on this work and showing it. We also did some uh, poultry studies with USDA, and this is what Aflatoxin in five parts per million does in a more impressive way. This is, this is one guy out of the 240 bars here, pulled out, they all look the same. This chick got the same level of Aflatoxin, five parts per million, but he had 0.5% um, Novacil in the diet totally pre prevented the, the malnourishment and the weight loss that we, that we see in the poultry. Uh, more importantly, uh, these are the controls here, absolute anaphylactic control. And looking at vitamin A in the liver, this is what aflatoxin did to that vitamin A. It almost reduced it 50 percent in the blood just from five parts per million uh, aflatoxin. And at low levels, including this is this is only 0.15 percent, 0.25 and 0.5, it rescued these chicks. From vitamin A today. And so I was really excited to see this because, again, vitamin A is a problem. It doesn't bind vitamin A. It prevents uh, aflatoxin today. And this is what the livers look like across the board when we're doing dogs that have been poisoned with this, or pigs. Their lipid, their lipid is filtrated. You can see it's plenty colored. There's parenchymal cell necrosis, biliary microplasia. You know, the cells are destroyed. And in the presence of a half percent clay at the same level of cause this, the liver looks just like normal. So again, I'm easily excited. As we were seeing this, I was very excited about this research and where we might be able to take it. So we did long-term studies for FDA, uh, and then this, this is going six and a half months in, in uh, Fred Dolly rats, and looking at everything you can think of, including pathology, and to make a long story short, this is all negative. There was no morbidity, mortality, feed consumption, feed conversion, body weight were not affected. And we did doses up to 2%. We would never give that high dose. But we went to 2% at a high dose here, and uh, that even 2% didn't affect uh, any of this, nor did it interfere with the vitamins, vitamin A, and the micronutrients uh, in the animal. And this was pathology with the same thing was negative. We did liver, kidneys, heart, lungs, brain, stomach, intestine. Skin. And again, there was no histopathology that was dose related in male or female rats after 28 weeks of exposure. So this study gave us the right to, to go into the first study, the phase one study in humans, uh, a dosimetry uh, study. Before I get into that, the, the findings here were that the clay tightly selectively binds aflatoxin, it prevents the disease in animals. It decreases the revenue of the food of animal origin, so it can decrease the amount in your ice cream, your bluebell, your yogurt, uh, your milk. Uh, it has a high affinity and a high capacity. The thermal dynamics favor the sorption in, in the inner layers I showed you, and which is selective. And mechanisms and sites, maybe a uh, electron donor acceptor, and probably possibly chelation. Um, quality control is critical because the stuff comes out of the ground. And here's a model showing. Uh, where we think we are. There's some edge sites here that are not totally coordinated, so they're good fluid acid sites. And so we could get chelation of the dicarbonyl roots across there. They're probably studying the lewis acid sites right now in 101. And uh, you can get, these are 14 to 18 angles in the inner layer. So you can get two of the molecules realistically in the inner layer and know they go in there. And you think this is where the electron donor acceptor uh, reaction is very, very tight. So most of it, Binding in the inner layer, remember that uh, early work. 
Now, current use in animals, this is being used all over the world in animals. It's in the Philippines, it's in Brazil, it's, it's uh, everywhere that they have problems with animals and aquatoxins. So it's within that area that I showed you, which is in the equatorial uh, zone. And so basically, um, it's being used by people, processors, and producers, and aquaculture industry. But, but the potential of what I was interested in when I started this work was to translate this work uh, to humans. And, and uh, that's what I'm going to show you. I started that, and that's where I wanted to go with it uh, from day one, and I'm on my way doing that. And especially humans who are high risk, because if you're going to, you know, populations that need this would be ones that are highly exposed to a moldy food and feed. And so those are in on the continent of Africa and in China. Uh, so I, I got a what's called a peanut crisp USAID grant for, for five years to do to look at sustainable mineral absorbent strategies. I call this an mineral absorbent design in the in the gap adjustment track uh, for the protection of African populations from aquifers. I had some great co-investigators at, at uh, Accra, who's in the capital city in Ghana, David Aporteje, and, and I'm not going to list them all, but this is the Gucci Memorial Institute medical research. So these are MD PhDs that I worked with. Jackson Wong is in, it was at Texas Tech in uh, Georgia. And then uh, also another is in Kena uh, in Kumasi who worked with him. And Kim Williams who was the director of this USA project. Our goals were to develop a play-based intervention for individuals and these populations at high risk for aflatoxin induced disease. And excess exposure using serum and urine bottle markers which, which have been already been shown to be linear and in really good biomarker exposure. And to look at safety by physical exam, and blood chemistry, and uh, electrolytes, and vitamins, et cetera, et cetera. In the first study, we wanted to look at um, um, basically an adverse event study. What you do before you, before you go to Africa, you need to run the study in the U.S. because there's sensitivity. You don't go straight to the African continent or even China until you, you test it. So we tested it in Red Raiders um, at, Texas a, at Texas Tech University, and there were 50 healthy adults, uh, ages 20 to 45, and this is my colleague who's a professor at, at TTU, and I wanted to test it here in my classes here. All the students were willing to sign up, but it was a conflict of interest for me as a professor here having invented this technology to do it. So we got Jackson Wong, who's an MD, PhD, to do it in Texas Tech. Uh, I think these 50 were football. Anyway, um, I said I wanted to say that. Uh, uh, the procedure for the two groups, this is a very simple study. Low dose with 500 milligrams and high dose 1,000 milligrams, three capsules three times a day. So it ended up at a total of three gram dose for the high dose or one and a half gram dose for the low dose. Bloods and urine were taken, lab analysis that was done in conjunction with uh, MDs at the uh, Health Science Center, which is a really nice center in uh, at Texas Tech. And um, the, the trial uh, found that uh, it was very safe, and very tolerable, there were no significant differences shown in any of those things. And so this gave us the right to, to, to uh, get an IRB uh, in Ghana and, and ask them to let us do a three month study, which is a phase 2A NIH study uh, for the first time in Ghana. Uh, the phase 2A human trial, which we finished uh, last year, uh, is in Ghana. I don't know how many of you have been there, but this is a country. It's uh, bordered by Togo, Upper Bowl, <coughs> and the Ivory Coast. There's about 20 million people that, that live there. The main tribe is the Ashante, uh, but there's a lot of other tribes. Uh, we flew into Accra, which is the uh, capital city, and we drove to Kamasi. It takes about nine hours land road, it's a very bad road, and then another two hours to our site in the northern Ashanti region called Edward. And uh, so it's a pretty grueling trip to get there, uh, but they're highly exposed to population. And so we got edible play from the marketplace, and this collected big one of the marketplaces, and they sell edible play. They come in from all the world. We've got 80 different ones. We've tested them thinking maybe we'll have something to bind back about. But if we did, we could go into the household and look at those that are eating clay versus those that aren't in an immediate pilot stage. And we tested these, and here's the best isotherm we got. It was nothing. Most of these, the reason is they're kaolinites or have full which don't have an inner layer. The 
build 14 angstroms or up to 18 angstroms that will allow aflatoxin to get in. And so they didn't find well. So we, we decided we would have to go with snow cell over there because, if you remember, the FOP is really good and the chemistry says that no cell will work nicely in animals, so that's what we decided to do. The hypothesis of the study was that the clay will act as mineral absorbing, resulting in reduced bioavailability of the diet. The design was a randomized, double blind, placebo controlled phase two clinical trial. Uh, it was approved by our IRB as well as the Ethical Clearance IRB in Ghana. And the groups were consisted of three gram high dose, one and a half gram low dose, and a placebo control group of microcrystalline sales. These green capsules we had produced for the first study, the Texas study. Then we changed the color um, to, to red, red and white, for the study that I'm going to tell you about now. But the placebo and the treatment look exactly alike, the texture's the same, the color's the same. You can't have a placebo control if anything's different about it, okay? This is a human study, and remember that. If you end up doing a human study, there's a lot of things you have to do, but your placebo has to be really good if it's going to be anything. The uh, inclusion, inclusion criteria was we first have to have signed and informed consent doctrine. You do humans, you have to have this first. You have to say they consent to you uh, using them in a study. They know what the study is about. 58, so we want to use adults. Uh, intake of corn and ground milk based foods at least four times a week, and that was easy because they <coughs> over where we're at, that's all they eat. Blood out humans, attic levels greater than this number, no history of chronic disease, no use of prescribed medication. Non-pregnant, non-breastfeeding females, normal range of all of these parameters. And then subjects that had abnormal liver function were excluded because again there's a lot of liver cancer over there from this aflatoxin. And that would be a confounder of this study. A target population of 180 was selected from 507 to be screened, and we ended up with 177 because two females dropped out and one male dropped out during the study, during the three-month study. Uh, this is where we were. This is how they drive their corn. Uh, this is a, a lady that's a cooking banku, which is a cornmeal, uh, and then, uh, excuse me, banku's over here. And then this lady is a curry kakia, which is a peanut soup. Again, peanuts, corn, apple toxins, and everything they do. They do they're some of the corn, and it's loaded with apple pellets, loaded with apple uh, And so we ran the study in blood. We were shocked to see that everybody, there was 100% frequency of, of aflatoxin in the blood. We hadn't seen that before. If I sampled you guys, you might see anywhere from non-detectable, maybe 3%, uh, maybe as high, according to if you eat a lot of peanuts and corn, in fact, maybe 10% of you would have, would have these uh, levels, but nothing as high as this you'd be down here. Uh, so we, we had a, a very highly exposed population, and I'm just going to show you the overall results here. I'm not going to get We confirmed the same thing in that three month intervention in Ghana. And the smallest effective dose, the three grams of the smallest dose that gives an effect in the animal, that's the equivalent of 0.25%. Uh, no adverse health effects from no cell in the diet was observed over a period of three months. We were really glad to see this. Uh, and again, that was a minimal effective dose. We can even go up on the dose and, and, and maybe get a better result. Novacil didn't interfere with the levels of vitamins A, D, or iron, just as we'd seen in the animal studies of zinc. And it significantly decreased serum levels of the albumin addict. This is a steady state addict. This represents the ingestion of, of, of aflatoxin over a three to six month period because of the half life. Whereas the M1 in urine is more like a 24 hour or 40 hour. It's a moving target, what you just had the day before. Uh, but this one shows 40% decrease in that steady state uh, level of exposure which is great. And then the M1, which is I mentioned is an acute biomarker, a shorter half-life, it showed the same thing, a little bit higher, 58% decrease in exposure. Decrease with very high levels of aflatoxin significantly over a three-month period. And they support the findings support the application of this play for protection of humans from acute and chronic disease from aflatoxin via this interval function therapy with capsules because we tested tablets flavored powders or by noticeable inclusion in common foods. Uh, because of this study, what Texas A&M did about a year ago is they, they um, uh, 
launched a company called Texas Mineral Farmers based on my research. And the company is now building me cabinets. And you can see how nice they are here. These are treatments and then treatment arms and then this is the placebo that I can use. They're building me capsules. And then we're, we're making uh, great cloud flavored hydrable powders. You hydrate this with water and it's like a Kool-Aid. And you take it before each meal. If you eat three meals a day, you take the fourth meal. I'm taking this further. I'm putting this now and asking them to put it in the sachet, you know, like the, you know, those, those pink sachets that have the sweeteners that you sweeten your tea with? We're going to put it in the sachet and it'll be flavored. You tear the sachet, it's sterile, and you tear it, you put it in the water, and you drink it before your meal. And so this is the company that Texas a and launched, and Dr. Robert Carpenter is, is the president, and uh, this is our fast job. In summary, um, Clay minerals are structurally and chemically diverse. Many are ineffective and non selective for the acidophagus, as we saw in the bottom. Based on our research, all sequestering agents should be rigorously evaluated in vitro and in vivo. Acidophagus <coughs> mineral program will meet the following criteria acceptable thermodynamic characteristics of living sorption, acceptable levels of carbon metals and oxygen carrier, efficacy in multiple animal species, safety of long term studies, negative interactions with vitamins and micronutrients. These are just some pictures. This was from the Infant Center in Angela. Blood collection that was occurring at the site. Uh, this is not like you know, a really fancy place as it takes a minute, so you have to make do as best you can in these places. Some of my monitors who watch and, and, and get the records of everybody that took this play, one of my former students, uh, in the post office, I did a junior, separating lymphocytes so to do our immune study. And these are all the monitors that some of my, my uh, colleagues in here, uh, Dr. Williams, uh, Dr. Wong, uh, uh, Nee Antra, uh, Evan Maria Jowell is a student, he's now a professor in Georgia, and, and I was taking a picture, and if you'll notice the head of the end that I have on these are the head of the kids, I think I bought all of these up at the bookstore, because I can't find them anymore, the take over there, but I made these guys honorary Aggies, and we talk about the traditions, and here they're showing the Aggie spirit band that the site is gone, and I found them going back in about two months, We'll initiate pilot studies, and in these pilot studies, which are very important, we're going to optimize those delivery in food. We're going to put this clay in, in their cornmeal and their and their uh, uh, peanut meal, either placebo or the treatment, and then have them cook their food, bakku and fufu and all these dishes that are making these, have them cook it, and then we're going to monitor the biomarker uh, for a two to four week period that they eat this food and see if we can deliver it by food instead of capital. That's extremely important, and that's what I'm going to do when I first go there. Then the next study will be a one-year duration with the CDC is going to go with us, and we're going to give them uh, those sachets that I talked about, you know, for a whole year. And instead of just looking at exposure, now we're going to look at infectious disease. How? Um, that's what CDC is interested in. So that was awesome. really affects the immune system. So we, we know from studies that you can see aflatoxin relations course of HIV AIDS and tuberculosis and malaria and all the things they have over there. So we're going to look at this infectious disease for that year's period where we're removing aflatoxin from, from their uh, exposure. And, and hopefully we'll show some kind of clinical impact. And that would be really, really important to get out. And we're going to look at multiple exposure to other compounds. At the end of this thing, uh, I couldn't have done this without a lot of my students and colleagues. I've got students that are all over the world now. And, uh, Plus four or five are still in my lab, and, uh, and, and a lot of uh, collaborators. And the funding for this was from USA, NIH, USDA, Texas Agrolife used to be PAES, and Eagle Heart Corporation, which this particular project was bought out by BASF, and then the Texas Department of Health. Thank you.